Hi, my name is Jill Work. This is a video version of a presentation I gave at PSLA, Pennsylvania School Librarians Association. Just to give you a brief background on myself, I started out as a music teacher and eventually added drama and art. Then I started working in public libraries in adult and children's services and went back to school to get my master's in library science. After I completed my degree, I switched back into education and worked in, as a school librarian and technology teacher. Over time, that eventually led to working as a STEM teacher. I am now doing just consulting um, as a STEM coach and a library presenter. As a STEM and maker educator, I've come up with certain guidelines in how I teach and how I approach this subject. I learned not to overestimate the actual physical abilities kids have to do the things that are required for making, whether it's coding or whether it's building or whether it's figuring out problems. But I also learned not to underestimate their ability to learn new things and rapidly advance. For every given project, I had to determine what I wanted them to learn. Did I want them to learn just the concept of something or an introduction to the idea of something, or do I want them to have a full understanding of it? Obviously, a lot of that is geared towards what age they are. When you are contemplating adding maker or STEAM projects to your library curriculum, one question you should ask yourself is, is it relevant to your information literacy curriculum or relevant to the parts of the collection that you are highlighting? A process-based approach spends more time working on the skills and the knowledge and building those skills and knowledge, even if at the end of the project, you don't have a polished or even finished product to show. In a product-based learning approach, you are more focused on getting it done and having something nice to show. Well, that's great for back to school night, but for the bulk of the year, I work on process. We use more raw materials. We don't do kits because that's not really part of what you're trying to learn. You're trying to put things together yourself in your own unique ways and learn how to problem solve with those materials at hand. Because this is a process, not a product, repetition will help build those skills and hone those skills. So never be afraid to repeat lessons or parts of lessons or certain skill building over and over again. And this is what I think is the most important point that you need to emphasize student discovery. This is something all the teachers talk about. We try to do project-based learning, student-led inquiry, this is where it's at. This is where the learning happens. This is where they're able to take those new skills and ideas they're building and apply them to other situations, other subjects, other parts of their life. I tend to follow a teacher as guide model rather than teacher as instructor. And I like to let the students figure it out and then tell me what they've learned. When you talk about the engineering design process, there are different words used. There are different numbers of steps. Some of them have eight or nine steps because they subdivide these steps. Some have different words that they like to use. These are the ones I was using in a school where I taught from pre-K up through eighth grade. In the pre-K through fifth grade, the elementary school, I used the simpler version of this, ask, think, make, test. And I wanted something that would transition to a little more sophisticated understanding of it in the middle school. Now, the middle school was a candidate for the International Baccalaureate Program, or IB program. So I used words that fit with the IB design process, inquire, develop, create, and evaluate. So we were basically following the same steps, just getting a little more sophisticated as the kids got older. These are my two absolute must-have favorite books for a makerspace STEM lab sort of situation. The Power of Yet 
is the idea that it's not that you can't do something, but you can't do it yet. In fact, I took that one step further and the students were not allowed to say, I can't do it. They could only say, I can't do it yet. And how to solve a problem. Of all the picture books that deal with problem solving, I thought this was the best at showing the different steps and the thought process and the iterations and eventually solving the problem. Using this book as an inspiration, I would talk about failure as not only being an option, but being something that is expected in my class and that mistakes are how we learn. We use the acronym FAIL. If it was the first attempt, it was the first attempt in learning. And if they failed a second or third or fourth or 20th time, it was a further attempt in learning. One common thread I've found among students all the way from nursery school even up through high school is that they are lacking in school tool skills. The basic ability to cut and glue and fold, to double a rubber band, to sharpen pencils, to use a binder clip, a brass fastener, a paper clip, to use a stapler without jamming it, to use a glue gun as they get older, to estimate things, estimate amounts and estimate length to clean a paintbrush, to securely put a lid back on a glue stick or on a marker. These are school tool skills. And if you're doing hands-on STEM projects, you are going to need a lot of these. And if you're a teacher who needs students to use these skills, then you need to help teach them because there is no one class where they learn school tool skills. You can't assume the classroom teacher or the kindergarten teacher or the art teacher will take care of this. You need to be part of the solution so that when they get to seventh grade, they actually can use a glue stick. They can fold a paper in quarters. They can cut anything with detail. The school tool checklist is included on the website at the above link. Using crayons is a school tool skill. I use this book and start as young as three so they can work on that skill. I like to use picture books as the inspiration for projects that will help teach those school tool skills. Many STEM projects have to do with how things move. This is a great mechanical motion type of introduction. It also helps students hone certain school tool skills. The link to the how to is on the slide. I used a kindergarten unit on the gingerbread man and related stories to work more on cutting, on folding, uh, on taping and on lacing. Once again, they use school tool skills to lace up the mittens, to cut out the cookies and decorate them with specific numbers of chips or M&Ms and to cover a piece of cardboard with foil and tape it on the back. While making paper airplanes is always a lot of fun for students of all ages, I also like to do paper copters. This one is simple enough for kindergarten and again has cutting and folding without creasing. This copter is much more complex and involves a combination of cut lines and fold lines and the addition of a paper clip. I have a number of projects that are built around the topic of symmetry, which covers one of the math standards as well as emphasizing some of these school tool skills. Notan is a Japanese cut paper art form that emphasizes light and dark. There are a number of variations on how you can do this. Ladybug symmetry is a good option for the younger students. A discussion of snowflake Bentley is a good place to start when studying snowflakes. I like to have students try to replicate one or two of the templates, but also to make their own snowflake and then make their own template and trace it and have someone else try to make a copy of their template. That way they're part of the creative process. They're innovating beyond just what they're given instructions for. 
The website and downloadable handout will both include the templates for the paper snowflakes and also a link to a digital snowflake creator that's really browser-based and really easy for students to use. For this project, students are given a single sheet of copy paper and asked to cut a hole in it big enough to walk through. A single hole, they can't cut it apart and retape it together or anything like that. For the most part, my STEM teaching was focused on engineering and technology. However, with kindergarten, I also did physical science because they weren't getting a regular meeting with a science teacher. Many of these physical science projects can be scaled up for older students. I like to include magnet play when working with early childhood the website has copies of the experiment sheets for kindergarten. On the day we do sink or float, I like to blow their minds by telling them you can actually float a paper clip. It works on surface tension and I will teach them how to do it and by the end of the class at least half of kindergartners will be able to do it. Using aluminum foil to build boats that will float and carry a payload is always a favorite project with students. Since early childhood students are still in the exploring phase of their learning, I like to insert some fun projects in the sun and shadow unit. On my YouTube site, I have an original poem about shadows appropriate for early childhood. Students can work on their tracing skills with shadow tracing. Students can compare and contrast the shadow drawings versus the shadows cast by magnetiles, where they're making essentially their own stained glass windows. I always end the sun and shadow unit with UV color changing bracelets. It's a huge hit. There's a video on my YouTube channel on light and sound appropriate for lower elementary. Morse code is one of my favorite ways to talk about how to communicate using light and sound because it can use either. Force in motion is probably my favorite physical science unit and I use it with all age groups working on chain reactions and Rube Goldberg machines, dominoes and creative chain reactions, dominoes and creative chain reactions. I like to use a variety of materials when students are doing chain reactions. And one of my favorites is stick bombs. Now with students, I call them stick explosions because it doesn't sound quite as scary in a school context. This particular project was a challenge to get the ball from the beginning to the end in exactly two minutes on video. They use a combination of commercial and homemade products. This was left on the board for do now and early finishers where they could make their own magnetic marble mazes on a whiteboard. One of the big projects in late second grade was building a balloon powered car. I also like to do some basic projects having to do with electricity and circuitry. Most circuitry products and projects are not really low budget. However, if you are going to do some paper circuits is a lower price entry point. If you have access to a Makey Makey, there's a whole wealth of projects you can do and you can combine it with coding in Scratch, which gives you a, another technology outlet. Engineering made up the bulk of my curriculum for STEM and many of the lessons were cross curricular so they would connect to other STEM topics or to other topics from throughout the school. I can't imagine doing engineering units without reading at least one, if not both of these books. One of my favorite 
combination of materials for rapid prototyping and other quick builds is pieces of swim noodles with toothpicks. A variation would be to use Dots candies, but that gets very messy and by the end of each class, everything has to be trashed. Just about any types of blocks or Kiva planks or Legos, any type of building materials are a great thing to have on hand if you're going to be doing engineering based projects. Stacking cups are an excellent entry point for early childhood students to learn about structure and balance. However, students of all ages up through middle school love working with stacking cups and they can be incorporated into chain reactions. They can be part of something you're doing with robots. There's a lot of ways to use them. Often the engineering projects will also have architectural aspects to them. This kindergarten project doing A-frame gingerbread houses was a little heavy on the prep time, but it was very inexpensive to do and utilized a number of school tool skills that the kindergartners needed to master. This is a project in which third grade students built a working latch on both sides of a piece of cardboard. On one side, I gave them the specifications and the materials. On the other side, they used any of the maker materials available to them to make their own original latch. In this particular project, the challenge is to build a geodesic dome entirely out of newspaper. We did this at a Maker's Day at a public library, and it was families with children of all ages. If done in a classroom or library setting, actually rolling all of the newspaper struts could be done as do nows or for early finishers. And once you have the materials all ready to go, then you need to set up an assembly time. These were the makers that were most heavily involved in building this dome. There are so many options for different kinds of bridges that can be built with students. But one of my favorites is making bridges out of a single sheet of construction paper inspired by the book 21 Elephants and Still Standing. There are numerous types of projects on building bridges and all of them help with creative problem solving and with thinking about structural engineering concepts. One of my favorites to start with is using a single piece of construction paper to build a bridge to hold 21 elephants. Most of the curricular projects I've done with students are based on free resources. But in this case, I actually did purchase a package from Teachers Pay Teacher on bone bridges. And the results were pretty spectacular for Q-tips, tape, and straws. I did another project in which students were divided into teams, and each team was able to pick a particular combination of materials from which they would make a bridge. And then they had the whole class period to make a bridge that would hold a particular rock. I've also used the rubber band bridge as a standalone project where everyone is given rubber bands to see which group would be the first to be able to hold up the rock on their rubber bands. There are a lot of low budget projects that can fall under the category of cardboard engineering. There is an inspiration video for cardboard engineering on my YouTube channel. Inspired by Kane's Arcade and the Global Cardboard Challenge, the sixth graders in my school would make arcade games and have an arcade day late in May every year. Another sixth grade cardboard engineering project was making a choice of two items for cats, either a cat castle or a device that could be used for a cat Roomba rider. Cardboard Transformer Costumes in Progress. The eighth graders worked on a wind energy unit with multiple projects in it, inspired by the book, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. One of the projects I gave eighth graders at the beginning of their wind energy unit was to make a pinwheel. All they were shown was this picture, nothing else. They were given this set of materials and told to make a pinwheel. It was harder than it looked. 
Since the pinwheel would be a little hard to construct for the early childhood, we did a paper spinner instead. What you can do with coding on a budget level depends on what kind of devices your school actually has in place. Now, offline coding you can do anywhere, anytime, and you don't need devices. So I usually start with that. The Very Hungry Caterpillar is the inspiration for this caterpillar sequencing project. A grid on the floor, either on the carpet or made with tape, will allow you to code people and make games using those codes. I had fourth graders actually develop their own games. I developed several very short introductions to coding concepts for young learners. They can be found on my YouTube site. There are many different ways that young students can practice sequencing. Sequencing can also be tied to literature where they sequence the story and they get the idea of how a sequence has to go in a particular order. How to code a sandcastle and the sequel how to code a roller coaster are my favorite titles to use to introduce students to coding concepts. My website has step-by-step -step instructions on how to do a classroom exercise on how to code a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. While robots are not a low budget option for doing STEM curriculum, if you've already got them in your space, you don't need to add expensive accessories or curriculum in order to use them. These are Code and Go Robot Mouse, which are among the lowest entry price point, and the coding is on the back of the mouse. The next level up in durability and capability and price point is the Beebot, which also has the code buttons right on the back of the, the bee. Moving up the ladder in expense and in capabilities, you have Botly, which can do black line following and is controlled by a remote control with some additional controls over what you would have on a Beebot. I love the versatility of Dash robots. They get a little more expensive yet, about $150, but they have a remote control mode, which is great for the early childhood, and they have a coding mode that uses black -like code. You can also use them with different devices. You can tape and attach things to them and do a lot of different types of curriculum with these robots. If you have tablets, computers, or Chromebooks, there are a number of apps that are free and available to use on those devices. I like using Keyboard Zoo for early childhood to introduce them to keyboarding, using Typing.com for the older students, and using Codable and Code.org for coding. Now, Codable, Code.org, and Typing.com all have the ability for you to set up student classrooms and track their progress. Now, in addition to these standalone lessons, you can also do multi-project and often multi-discipline types of units. All of the lessons described in this presentation can be used as a standalone lesson over one or two class periods or can be part of a larger unit. For example, the caterpillar sequencing, ladybug symmetry, climbing spider, and bee bots could all be used as part of a bugs and crawly things unit for early childhood. In celebration of International Dot Day in September, I did a mashup of Not a Stick and The Dot with the younger students. For the older students, we did a much stickier version of swim noodles and toothpicks using dots candies. Everything was trash by the end of the day, but they had a great time making two and three dimensional shapes. Another unit that involved different types of projects with different grade levels was celebrating the Lunar New Year. Of course, we started with books. This is an example of a symmetry project that was done during the Year of the Tiger. This is a project that will be available during the latter part of this workshop. 
Continuing with the symmetry and also the tiger theme, another class did corner bookmarks of tigers. I also prepared a number of symmetrical halves of letters to see if they could guess what letter they belong to. Another class worked on a quad fold project, and once you unfolded it, it turned into the Chinese symbol for double happiness. This is the completed bulletin board featuring these projects. Another class worked on a Chinese garland in which they did each did a segment and then glued them all together. And yet another class did these Chinese rattle drums that involved painting a Chinese character and adding the beads as drum beaters. I like to do a lesson on catapults and pumpkin chunky to go with either a fall harvest or a Halloween theme. There are three successive videos on my YouTube site that talk about catapults, trebuchets, and the pumpkin chunky competition. And then we make a simple catapult, wad up some orange paper to be pumpkins, and have our own contest. Another Halloween or un-Halloween type of project is creepy carrots. It inspires the students to make their own carrot traps. This was one of my favorite solutions to the carrot problem in Creepy Carrots. The girl decided that the carrots and bunny should become friends, and then they won't even need the traps. Now, the Creepy Carrot patch may not really have anything to do with STEM, but I do it anyway because it makes a great bulletin board. But it has a lot to do with a library book, so you can get away with it a little more easily than I can. And of course, if you're going to talk about creepy carrots all week, you need to dress the part. The eighth graders spent their entire year working on projects related to sustainability. Their final project was a series of lessons having to do with wind energy. The final unit I'm going to talk about is for Thanksgiving and it's inspired by the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade Balloons and the book Balloons Over Broadway. Now the book is a little complex for the younger readers so I tend to just sort of summarize it for them and discuss it and watch some video clips of the Macy's Parade. But with the older kids we get into more in depth. This was another event that involved multiple ages and multiple classes doing different types of projects. The youngest students made headbands for the balloons to wear in the parade. I stand corrected, headbands and ears. Another class made turkeys that were affixed to the dash robots. When the dash robot would nod, the turkey would flap. And yet another grade made floats, which were pulled by a string by the robots. The Budget Steam website includes information on how to do these projects, uh, instructions and links and pictures and videos. Some of the projects are not complete in the website. It's a constant work in progress. If you look on my website, you can find more information about these projects. Some are external links to other sites and some are links to my own instructions and pictures. All of the relevant YouTube links are included in the website, but you could also go to the standalone playlist for Budget Steam.